Beginning, beginning morning on these locations. All right, hello and welcome everyone. For those of you who are uh, here live in the room, know that this is being recorded. For those of you who are on Teams, oops, I'll you. Um, I'll ignore it. For those of you who are um, on Teams, you've seen the sign saying that it's being recorded. It's true as it is. Uh, today, uh, we're having this talk, which is a question mark uh, by our distinguished professor, Dave Parker who is um, perhaps giving this as his last NDU-wide lecture after a uh, long career, um, first in the military and then in academia. And so today he'll be reflecting on his experience in sharing it with us. Uh, Dr. Parker will be speaking for about half an hour, after which time we'll make space for questions and answers. Uh, for those of you who are online, please type your questions and I will read them for you. For those of you in the room, just go ahead and line up at the microphone and we'll go from there. Uh, and so uh, with that, let's please welcome Dr. Parker to the stage. Okay, so this should be interesting. Uh, needless to say, I've been working on this for a few years, like about 30. And uh, as I sat down to compose it, I started out kind of like this. Uh, and then kind of went to this. And before I was finished, it kind of looked like oh, this. So um, it may bounce around a little bit. Uh, hey, that's the nature of what we do, right? Um, so uh, First of all, let me begin by thanking you all for being here. Thank you to Dana uh, Barnes for uh, offering this opportunity and uh, for setting this up. Uh, and as always, I have to begin with the standard disclaimer that the opinions I express are mine and not necessarily those of the US government, the Department of Defense or National Defense University. Although usually about two minutes into the speech, that's pretty much glaringly apparent. Um, so, there's an expression that you sometimes hear. Uh, I recall first hearing it mostly from baseball players about uh, the idea of being in the zone. Uh, that moment when everything slows down, everything seems to come into sharper focus. Um, the step you need to take and the step after uh, become obvious. Uh, baseball players talk about it being so acute that they can count the stitches on the baseball. Um, and in that, what is estimated by scientists to be roughly 0.25 seconds that a batter has to react to a ball being pitched, everything is laid out and they're able to uh, step up and connect bat to ball. And what should happen, what must happen, happens. And you'll hear that same expression in the zone used by race car drivers, sculptors, trauma surgeons, um, generally the range of artists and scientists. Um, as someone who is notoriously, really glaringly atrocious at anything that involves things being thrown or caught or hit, uh, I had pretty much given up on the idea of ever being in the zone uh, until a moment roughly 35 years ago when I stepped in front of a classroom for the very first time and faced a room full of students. And all of a sudden, all those things happened. Things slowed down. My thoughts became clarified. The next comment 
and the question that should follow that became obvious. What I should be writing on the board, what I should be holding, withholding, um, was all laid out. Uh, and I was kind of stunned because I pretty much given up hope that that would uh, ever happen to me. Uh, and I remember mentioning it to colleagues afterwards, and there was a mixture of a couple of older souls, and by older, I mean people who now would look young to me, kind of smiling and going, mm, yeah, yeah. And a couple going, what the hell was he talking about? Um, but for me, it was real. It was visceral. It was emotional. It was spiritual. Uh, and I wanted more. And I have been writing that for uh, for over three decades now. Uh, this is what I was meant to do, even if I didn't necessarily recognize it or see it at the time. So here we are uh, 35 years later, and I have reached a milestone, one of those turning points in a career and I'm giving you what we have come to call as a custom because it has now happened more than twice over the course of the last 10 years within this profession, a tradition uh, of presenting the last lecture. And there are a number of things that are kind of anticipated or expected when that happens uh, of what it is you'll talk about and what it is you'll focus on. So. Let me kind of start off by kind of explaining what to expect and what not to expect. So wh what is the last lecture? Is it supposed to be like the, the last gasp of a, of a fading old schoolmaster? Uh, is this going to be a searing analysis prompting a passionate call to arms? Are we going to resolve all the problems of postmodernism versus structuralism? Uh, will Bloom and B.F. Skinner and Montessori and Piaget be reconciled? Uh, the quant shall lay down with the archivist? Um, uh, no. Uh, while I hope those kinds of arguments and those kinds of debates continue because they're what drive our profession forward, uh, there are not going to be any grand unified theories released today. Um, so uh, that's not going to happen. Um, this is not going to be a litany of memories like the corners of my mo mind all alone in the moonlight. Uh, I have a lot of tales, as many of you know, uh, some amusing, some horrifying. Uh, you're painfully aware that I love to tell stories, and be assured I will happily do so in other settings and forums, uh, just not today. Uh, most of all, this is not a full stop. Like many of you, uh, I realized that since my fifth birthday, in every single year that has passed, I have been either a teacher, a student, or both. And I'm not about to quit that now. Um, that's why, in part, the title up there, up there, of last lecture is uh, is followed by a question mark. So, uh, what in fact is going on here? Uh, what is it that I'm uh, hoping to do? Um, I'm not going to deliver a screed about uh, joint professional military education, although I have, uh, and I could, um, but uh, that's not really my purpose here. Uh, furthermore, I've, I've come to the realization, having spent time in what passes as quote-unquote real academia, uh, long enough to recognize that many of the frustrations, the challenges, those things that just uh, anger us so much about teaching in the joint professional military education system uh, have doppelgangers in the civilian education world as well. Um, and while there are days when we are frustrated by either the demands or the, the pace or the restrictions that, uh, that we face, um, those of us, uh, which I would, uh, feel confident in saying include just about everyone in this audience uh, who are part of this profession uh, are aware of what's happening to uh, colleagues at uh, state universities and colleges all across this country. 
uh, Florida and uh, and the ugliness that is going on there is just one glaring example. Um, and for everything that uh, I've experienced in the JPME system, where I've said, come on, there's got to be an easier way to do this. I remember doing this at Georgetown or George Washington or being a visiting fellow at Princeton or Columbia or wherever. Uh, and uh, and it was quick and easy. Uh, there were also things that happened at those universities uh, and that continue to happen uh, where I would find myself saying, gee, I kind of wish I was in the JPME system today. So none of that is going to be uh, on the menu today, although I'm sure I will break down and make some snide, uh, sarcastic and bitter comments as asides uh, because you all would expect nothing less. Um, let me uh, kind of focus instead on three specific points that after all these years have come to be sort of the core principles that are the basis for my, call it what you will, teaching philosophy. Uh, in which I have grounded myself and which has kept me in the zone. Uh, and, and I have managed to stay in that zone pretty consistently. Uh, in fact, when uh, Ben and I were teaching uh, about a week ago in my last formal class session in CESA, I actually kind of stopped and quietly asked myself, so is it still there? Yep, still was, still was, every bit as much as it was on the first day. Um, the three points that I'm going to focus on uh, come to us from uh, three seemingly very distinct and different individuals uh, stretched across literally centuries. Plutarch, Gertrude Stein, and Marshall McLuhan. So the first is Plutarch, uh, the Greek historian and Greek philosopher, but Greek philosopher I uh, I repeat myself, um, who gives us uh, an idea of what education is supposed to be in his writings, whether that was his intention or not. Uh, and it's important to me because in this in this profession, as many of you know, the temptations of almost messianic vanity are very hard to resist. I have knowledge. If you don't believe it, count the initials after my name. Uh, I can easily convince myself that uh, students are blank states, uh, blank slates. Uh, in fact, I recall one of my uh, colleagues and very good friends uh, in my early years of teaching, jokingly, I hope he was joking, saying, I am so eager to get to class because the students are empty vessels into which I will pour my knowledge. Uh, the Plutarch minds, uh, reminds us that the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. We're not here to create clones. Students are not meant to simply download our brains into theirs. Mimicry and rote repetition are not learning. Real learning opens the minds to possibilities that even teachers do not yet grasp. Think to yourself, has there been a moment in a class when you've been open enough that a student has raised a point or made a comment and you've had to stop and say, I hmm, never really, thought, yeah, I, you, you might be onto something here. The idea that your purpose of sparking that kind of creativity, that kind of deep thought, that kind of critical thinking, to use a phrase that we hear a lot of, um, it is really at the core of, uh, of what it is we do professionally, is to me a really important one. And I remind myself of it uh, every day. Uh, and Plutarch kind of expands on this day, uh, on this idea. Uh, in his writings in Moralia, he argues that, uh, and I'm quoting here, it motivates one towards originality. It instills the desire for truth. Suppose someone were to go and ask his neighbors for fire and discover that there's already a substantial blaze there and just stays there continuously warming himself. That's no different from someone who goes to someone else 
to get some of his rationality and fails to realize that he ought to ignite his own innate flame and his own intellect. So with Plutarch in mind, that is why I assign readings frequently, as I know some of you do, that absolutely contradict each other. That's why I will throw out ideas that I'm not even sure I fully agree with or believe. That's why I firmly believe and have come to believe it even more over the years that a student should learn as much from taking a test as they learn from studying for that test. It's why we work for those moments when students challenge our arguments, even better for those moments when students are willing to challenge the views they brought with them at the beginning of a course. And that requires patience. It requires a reinforcement. It requires teachers who are comfortable with challenges to their wisdom. And it requires a faculty who can accept and even embrace with enthusiasm the possibility that at the end of the term, the faculty member will have learned as much from their students as the students learned from the teacher. So the next foundational point to me are the words of the existential den mother of the lost generation of post-war expats frequenting Paris in the 1920s and 30s. And many of you in this room, uh, forgive me because you've heard me tell this story many, many times. You've seen me leave kind of the graffiti behind in your classroom. Um, but here's the story. Uh, when the poet and essayist and mentor to many great artists, Gertrude Stein, lay dying in the American hospital in Paris, she looks around the room at her assembled soon-to-be mourners and says, what is the answer? Now, as dying words go, that's not particularly original. It's pretty standard and unimaginative. But when she heard no reply, Gertrude said, in that case, what is the answer? And died. Students seek answers. We as professors are happy to give them. But if we do so without examination, without consideration of what it is we're presenting, we're both skipping an essential step. What is the question in the classroom, in the policy world, in life in general, we, all humans, have a tendency, uh, some say it is actually neuro-driven, to embrace answers first. And in so doing, we often reveal our already predetermined biases. We're asking questions that reaffirm the answers we've already formed in our, in our minds. Uh, we learn what we want to be told. And like Plutarch's admonition, um, Gertrude challenges us to take a step back, a step back from the preconceived, a step back from the predetermined, um, and ask ourselves and ask our stu students, what is it we're really talking about here? Is the question, why do states fail? Or are there deeper questions about why states exist and how governance happens? Is the question about why states engage in conflict in some circumstances and engage in cooperation? Or are there deeper layers to that that we must examine first? Are we presenting the second and third order questions of the truly essential ones that must be brought about up front? So finally, we come, <laughs> come to Marshall McLuhan, who began his career as an obscure Canadian scholar of James Joyce and became a pop culture icon to the Woodstock generation. Uh, people back in the day, and I'm old enough to remember that day, uh, would race to find his readings when they'd heard, hear somebody say something uh, that was a McLuhanism and be stunned to find that he wasn't uh, just kind of leveling off from his least, uh, most recent uh, dose of Owsley or Orange Crush on Hate ashbury uh, but was in a, a, a tie and a coat with patches on the elbows and short hair and, and making all these ponderous statements um, with an unmistakable Canadian accent, uh, that he was not a radical, that he was in fact a pretty conservative, uh, even traditional pre-Vatican II Catholic, 
uh, in, in his life and his uh, practices. But over time, having studied uh, the second and third and what eventually became fourth and fifth order questions to what he um, talks about, uh, uh, or what uh, he he initially was studying with Joyce and, and uh, literature, uh, he began to realize that there were uh, powerful complex forces at work, uh, not some mysterious conspiracy, but just sort of a, uh, an interconnection, a complexity, if you will, uh, and that it drove and still drives uh, the dynamics of change and uh, paradigmatic shifts and he didn't like what he saw, uh, but he famously said, look, I am absolutely opposed to all change, but I'm determined to understand the juggernaut that is about to roll over me. You can't ex escape the zeitgeist. Um, uh, look the word up, it will be on the exam. Uh, what what do we mean by zeitgeist and what do we mean by uh, the juggernaut that rolls over us? Well, McLuhan wrote about this idea of media being an extension of our senses. And by media, he didn't just mean the baseline television, radio, um, uh, print, uh, whatever. He took media to be any extension of our senses, um, a long uh, essay on uh, the uh, on the shoe as an extension of the foot, for example. Uh, but his point was that the consequences of changes brought about by new media and by different uses of changing media are more consequential than any message that is carried by the media itself. What you say has less of an impact than what you say when it is communicated by television, when it's communicated by film, when it's communicated in person, when it's communicated in print. And obviously you're probably grasping here that this would take a long time for me to uh, explain in detail, but let me, uh, let me take one particular example, one that I like to use. Um, and that Gutenberg used frequently, or that uh, McLuhan used frequently, and that was of Gutenberg. Um, Gutenberg, obviously had an impact on changes in media. Inventing movable type, set aside for a moment the fact that he invented movable type in Europe when it already existed in East Asia. It's just the, the two almost simultaneous uh, occurring events had not yet intersected. Um, but the invention of movable type had an immediate purpose. It takes a lot of money, takes a lot of time, with very little return to have a bunch of squint-eyed monks leaning over a manuscript, doing curly cues and painting in all the figures. What if there was a way to print those Bibles faster and get them out to market? And Gutenberg wasn't even someone who's involved in the printing business. He was a goldsmith. And as Gutenberg, as McLuhan often notes, it's people who are parallel to or just on the outside of a particular profession or Profession, uh, particular practice, who can see the possibilities and the opportunities for change far more than someone who's engaged in it on a day-to-day -day basis. Once that is unleashed, you cannot get it back. And the consequences that Gutenberg unleashed, we could talk about for days, and in fact, many of us have taught classes where we talked about some of those consequences. The Reformation the acceleration of the uh, concept of having biblical writings communicated in native language, in day-to-day -day, uh, discourse. The idea that the hierarchy that stands between the foundations of faith and the faithful is not an essential point. And all the institutions meant to support that, the church, the state as it existed prior to that time, the education systems such as they were. Bear in mind that universities had been around for about five, 600 years before Gutenberg invented uh, his printing press uh, about a block and a half away from the, the dome plots in Mainz. All of that began to accelerate. 
the Age of Enlightenment, the breakup and the schisms of the Catholic Church and the Protestant Reformation, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the underlying scientific revolutions, all came from the change in the way knowledge was gathered and the way it was disseminated. And what happens when that occurs, and these kinds of moments have occurred more than once in, in the course of human history, you have this dramatic acceleration that you cannot control and you cannot pull back. But at the same time, you have this nostalgia, this almost painful, very visceral desire to go back to a previous way of doing things that, number one, you cannot get back. And number two, if you examine it carefully using the tools that Plutarch and Gertrude gave us, if you examine it carefully, you realize that past was never really what you thought it was, that you have created kind of a gauzy nostalgia uh, for something that not only can't be recaptured, but that you never had. With that come a number of different things. There is a, a, a psychological phenomenon. It, it, it's tied in with uh, almost a, a neurological response. Of when you are in a situation where things are physically accelerating so fast that you have two choices, to fling yourself off or to, to hang on and ride it to the end. And that impulse to fling yourself off without recognizing that the consequences and the dangers and the risk to you are far greater than hanging on for the ride is sometimes just too much to be overpowered. Um, and from that come again and again, strains of fundamentalism, of fundamentalism in terms of politics, in terms of religion, uh, in terms of uh, philosophy, uh, a reach back to scientific ideas that you now know to be no longer scientific, a seeking of a simpler knowledge rather than facing bigger, more complex truths. There is also a tendency to view yourself as being the only one caught in that bubble, to draw yourself tighter and tighter into the stovepipe where you happen to live on a day-to-day -day basis and not recognize that this is happening all over. For the last uh, eight to 10 years in this country, we have been focused on, obsessed with, and either celebrating or complaining, dramatic political tides that are pulling patterns of governance and patterns of the social order backward. And we tend to think it is only happening to us. And when we lift up our gaze, we recognize that it is happening in capitals all over the world, in cultures all over the world, and that the consequences of those changes that are driving that are not things we can simply control with a lecture, with a lesson, with a new book, with a new refereed article. Um, these are things that we must struggle to understand and we can project, but even doing that creates a, a fear that is sometimes greater than the fear of continuing to live with, uh, with where we are. Um, the danger then is that we become so caught in our straitjackets those narrow stovepipes where we are not making connections to other examples and other occurrences and other ways of thought that it literally becomes suffocating uh, and strangulation, strangulation occurs, not just for the individual, but for the society or for the state. So in that kind of an environment, how, how dare we believe that we have a responsibility to present pre-digested knowledge as the final answer. What gives us the audacity to say, this is the way I remember it and I understand it and I've spent years studying it and therefore that is the way you must understand it and must study it, simply because of whatever authority we've been given as teachers. 
had an exchange the other day uh, with a uh, a very dear friend, a young woman who is uh, currently in graduate school in a fairly prestigious program that shall not be named. And she was talking about an example in class of a professor who was trying to explain what happened post COVID and why it was really essential for people to get back together face to face and in person and to have water cooler conversations and coffee room talks, because otherwise you're not communicating, you're not sharing ideas and you're not moving forward. And the reaction of my young friend and many of her students was not just amusement, it was outrage. And immediately in class, they began texting each other on one of their network channels that they use to learn and to study together about what this professor was missing and how dare he view them so patronizingly. And, and bear in mind, these are individuals who were not unlike our students, uh, early career or, or somewhere near mid-career. Um, it was just a vivid reminder to me of all those basic principles, that the mind is not a vessel to be filled, it is a fire to be kindled, that we must ensure that we are asking the right questions rather than racing after answers, and that we must recognize that we live in a high-risk, ambiguous, dramatically changing world that we cannot rein in or control. I personally believe that the information revolution or whatever you want to call it that we're undergoing now has only been rivaled by the follow-on to the Gutenberg revolution. And the Gutenberg revolution played out over the course of hundreds of years. And some of the consequences of that are not done yet. Ultimately then, to me, education is about connections. It's about reaching beyond your narrow discipline and your knowledge and reaching out to others. When was the last time you used a work of art or used an example from the so-called hard sciences to illustrate a question of state security or of irregular warfare or of global development? Or when was the last time someone who teaches in one of those disciplines sat down with you and started comparing ideas and thinking about the larger mosaic of what we present to our students. How often are we caught in that stovepipe? How often do we just repeat the same bromides? And given the unique nature of our students and what we teach, risk becoming like Cantoric, the schoolmaster in All Quiet in the Western Front, who uses his platform and his position and his authority to encourage, to urge, to in many ways bully um, his students into marching off to what we can only refer to now sarcastically as the Great War. As educators, we come to class each day prepared to teach but if I conclude anything here, it's that we also come to learn. We come to challenge rather than to confirm and to be honest about our own ignorance and to be honest about our own curiosity. We should be like Chaucer's clerk. Gladly would we learn and gladly would we teach because otherwise we can never be like Emerson's essay on the American scholar, in which he warns us that there can be no scholars without heroic minds. So let me kind of sum up by going back to another example from my first year of teaching. I was away from the campus. I was with students, but I was traveling as the escort coach, uh, chaperone and uh, money keeper 
for the West Point cadet speech team. We were at a tournament at a small state university in a major state that will not be named, but it was one of those kinds of institutions that had been a small college or a, a, a normal school or a, a teaching academy uh, at its founding. And then in the dramatic events spurred by post-World War II and the uh, the advent of the GI Bill, it, it had grown and emerged as a university. And what I tend to do when I go to other campuses, because I'm an educator and I'm kind of, you know, a junkie for these kinds of things, is I looked around for a copy of the student newspaper. Um, as an old student newspaper editor, I'm always curious to see what is uh, is happening in that field. Um, uh, spoiler alert, it's almost gone now, it's all online. Um, but I picked up a copy of the paper and on the front page was an obituary of a faculty member who had recently died. And this was someone who had seen that full sweep from a small college in a quiet town uh, upstate to a major university who was part of that generation that came back from the war and saw new possibilities, not only for themselves, but for the world that they lived in. Who'd started off when to be a classroom teacher required a master's degree, not a doctorate. And when the balance between research and teaching was in fact a balance uh, and not a uh, over um, dedication to one at the expense of the other. And as I read through the tributes to this uh, individual, there was a quote by the president of the university uh, who had come to know this man over the years, viewed him as his mentor. And he said something that I will never forget. So this was the finest man ever to get chalk dust on a coat. For those of you kids in the audience, chalk is something we used to write on uh, a chalkboard with. A chalkboard is something that used to be uh, where we now have PowerPoint screens. Um, I took that example to heart. And over the course of my many years now, um, I've had a lot of different ambitions. Uh, my paths have led several ways for opportunities some of which I was able to capitalize on, some of which I quite frankly, totally blew. Uh, and as I look back now on my career, I realize the greatest ambition uh, that I could have had was the one that I uh, set for myself, that at some point uh, I was worthy of that chalk dust on my coat. So with that, I will stop this rant and do as I like to do, open up the floor for questions, and we'll see you again somewhere down the road because the education train never stops, and I'm not getting off anytime soon. Thank you. So, questions? Yes, Professor Deering. Okay, fascinating stuff. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about PME. Sure. Um, you know, it, it, it's been over the last few years, at mm -hmm. least, probably much longer. It's been challenged yeah. in Congress, you know, whether it's worth it or we're doing it the right Always way. It's been, yeah. Um, is it better to be done? By private institution outside of, you know, war colleges and such. So from someone who's been both a student and a professor in PME, how do you see the sort of evolution of it and its value? Uh, yeah. For the war um, yeah. Let me come at this from a couple of different angles. Uh, a former colleague and, and friend, and and uh, I hope he considers himself a, my mentor, a guy by the name of Don Snyder who had a, a, a phenomenal military career and then left the military and, and became an academic, uh, spent the better part of a decade writing on this idea of the military as a profession. 
uh, because in his mind, we had lost sense of the fact that we are a profession, not just a job. And one of the essential traits of any profession is it takes responsibility for the education, for the entry level validation, and for the continuing development of the members of its profession. My wife is an attorney. Every year that she was an active attorney, she had to take professional coursework for continuing legal education. I have friends, as I'm sure many of you do, who are doctors and surgeons. They're constantly going back and revalidating what they do. Part of what we are supposed to do as scholars with our own research, however imperfectly, and by attending and being active participants in disciplinary organizations like ISA and APSA and others, is acting as professionals. One of the things that I cannot get past, and maybe this is just me whistling in the wind, is this idea that if we take PME, professional military education, and separate it from the profession, then we're no longer a profession. That has to be linked. That creates tensions, lots of tensions, some of which, some of us have had conversations about this within the last several days. The fact that in PME, we are, we think, particularly vulnerable to someone somewhere in a position of authority, seeing a bright, shiny object, squirrel, and wanting to go chasing after it. You know, you all have to now take all of your core cat courses, and oh, just as a crazy example, focus them on two particular countries because they happen to be in the headlines now. Um, that's a temptation that I understand. Um, and I am here to tell you that in the civilian academic world, you get the same thing. I saw it happen um, in story time afterwards. I can tell you about one university that had a master's program that had a component that addressed a very particular part of international affairs. Someone came to the university very excited about that particular component, didn't bother to think about where it fits into the rest of the, of the academic world, didn't bother to look at what that university was doing already in what was at the time one of its more popular programs, and said, here is a bunch of money to stand up a brand new program separate and apart that is a master's degree in this field. Now, did the university at the time, one of the top five schools in the country in our field, say, no, no, that's okay, we've got this covered? No, not hardly. They grabbed the check and wrote on the back for deposit only signed so and so university and cash that sucker before the end of the day. We're not alone in chasing after these bright, shiny objects. Where we have a particular responsibility and we have our own unique difficulty is ensuring that before we chase that, there is some kind of a debate, that there is a respect for those in the profession who do what we do. Um, I can tell the story because I have been on both sides of, uh, of this divide, but it actually belongs to uh, Joe Collins, who was one of our colleagues at this university for many years. If there was anyone who ever deserved the title emeritus from NDU, it was Joe. Uh, and he talked about after having a, uh, a pretty more than reasonable, very impressive career as an infantry officer, uh, transitioning, becoming part of the West Point faculty, then retiring and becoming part of the faculty here, and in between serving on the staff of several uh, uh, chairmen and uh, of the Joint Chiefs and Army Chiefs of Staff. And he was tapped to serve on a promotion board. And as he's sitting around with the other board members, all of them kind of mainstream officers in their, their discipline, they said, what is it that you do? Oh, I'm a professor at uh, West Point, part of the permanent faculty. Yeah, that, you know, that just sounds like such a great life. Uh, you know, I, I keep thinking that uh, after I retire and, you know, I've committed my brigade and committed my division, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to go become a permanent faculty member at one of the uh, academies of the or the defense war colleges. And Joe would always say, you know, funny you should mention that, because I've always thought that once I finish my academic career, I'd like to go, you know, be a brigade commander or a division commander or command a battle task group or a carrier uh, force group. They go, well, what, what do you mean? You couldn't possibly do that. Well, guess what, buddy? We have elements within our profession that you need to understand and recognize and, uh, and respect. 
and we don't pretend to have the last word, uh, but we should at least be a word at the table. And you should not be put off by the fact that we often argue, uh, sometimes bitterly, um, because in those arguments are found the kinds of discussions that move the force forward. And if you don't think that's true, look at the American military between World War I and World War II. And the one driving vital element of that force was the focus on professional military education, not training, not this is the M203 law, I will inspect it for cracks, dents, bulges, or gouges, turn facing the enemy in an loud and forceful voice, say back last area clear, that's training. That gets ingrained. I still remember it 35 years, 40 years later after I first learned it. But education. Um, and that led to a whole range of innovations. There's an entire college here at National Defense University that owes its existence to then Captain Dwight David Eisenhower, who said, you know, going to war is more than just guns and bombs. There's kind of an economic uh, component to this. There's an industrial base. Maybe somebody should be studying that. And by the end of the Second World War, someone calculated that 30, I think it was 32 of the 34 core level commanders or higher uh, in, the, uh, in the Army and the Marine Corps uh, had, in addition to having been students, had been faculty at an academy or a war college in the interwar period. Um, the tensions and the pressures pushing against that are hard. But there are some things that PME does that others don't. A real shock to me, stepping into a leadership role in a civilian university, was saying, um, okay, I'm responsible for this program here. Uh, why don't we all sit down and talk about, you know, where the electives follow from the, these core courses and ensure that we are truly preparing our students for those follow-on courses um, and that they're getting the foundational information that they need, uh, you know, not talking about dictating syllabi or anything, but, but let's think about this as a progression and how these courses connect and build. Crickets. No one even replied to my email. And when I said, I'll drop by your office, I am not kidding. They made a point of not being there. They did not want to talk about getting out of their nice, comfortable little stovepipe. And this is a great school for which I have the greatest respect. And several of those individuals on that email trail are people who had long been friends and colleagues and still are. But it's a problem in PME, but we're not alone. It, that is, to me, part of the nature of the education system, higher education. It's one of the inherent tensions. And people don't like our tensions because we tend to argue and bicker and, and say nasty things about each other. But hey, you know, it's what, it's what we do. Yes, the person holding the laptop. Well, on behalf of online, we've got a question from uh, George Lafke at the Eisenhower School. And his question to you is, as a new NDU faculty member, what do you wish you had known early in your career? And in particular, what would have helped your students be better pre prepared for the careers that they faced? Ah, okay. If I'm hearing that correctly, that's a two-part question. What as a faculty member and what as a student? Okay, having been both, I'll, I'll give that a try. Um, as, a, as a faculty member, what took me a while to learn, and I was truly blessed by having some just tremendous mentors and bosses that I worked for early in, uh, in my career, was uh, understand the students, uh, understand where they're coming from and understand where they're coming from is not where you came from. Um, there is a nasty tendency in the JPME system. Um, and I have caught my, I caught myself doing it myself early in the career uh, of saying, well, this is what it was like when I was a captain or I was a Lieutenant Colonel. This is what the environment, the strategic environment was and how I responded to it. This is the nature of soldiers, airmen, sailors, whatever. Uh, and therefore, whatever I convey to you must be filtered through that. One of the first and most important tasks that a faculty member, I believe, has to do, again, to my example of, uh, of my young friend in the graduate program, is to be able to step back and say, not everybody gathers by a water cooler anymore. Um, it, I remember vividly the day that it punched me right in the head when I was lecturing in a seminar 
when I should have been seminarying, um, and was telling a room full of, uh, of cadets circa 1988. Well, if you'll remember, during the Vietnam War, right after the Tet Offensive, and one brave cadet finally raised his hand and said, sir, most of us were not born then. That was my prism, and that was where I viewed, for that matter, that's what drove me to grad school, and that was the topic of my dissertation. Of course I'm going to convey that, but you've got to step back from that. As a student, what I didn't often get, but when I did, painful and difficult as it was, I really learned to value and would catch myself a year, five years, 10 years later thinking about where there's mo were those moments when my own assumptions were challenged and where information was given to me in a way that I had to wrestle with it rather than just, just digest it and carry it forward uh, because that was the way things are and that was the way things were going to be. Um, General Norman Schwarzkopf was doing his victory lap post Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and came to West Point to speak to the Corps of Cadets. And he said, you know, uh, you have to bear in mind that many of the things that you're studying on, where you're narrowing down with a great deal of specificity and thinking about where may I find myself as an officer having to defend the nation's interest, um, you can't know. And what you think is important now will not necessarily be important later. And as a member of the class of 1956, I can tell you, nobody was thinking about or talking about or teaching about Vietnam. And that was the bulk of our career. Of course, he quickly followed up by saying, nobody was talking about it except for those commo pinky, uh, commie pinkos in the Department of Social Sciences. Um, but uh, as a student, recognizing that many of those things that I think I am fully preparing myself for that are going to be gone before I am even off the stage and have checked my diploma to see if my name was spelled correctly. Um, uh, th those two points are important. Pete, I believe you had a question. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> um, I actually want to piggyback on something that Matt brought up. You've given us three great points here today, drawn from across the board. And yet, one would think that up front, these would be much easier to deal with than sort of civilian academia, right? The, the pinko commies of the social world, so mm -hmm. to speak. Although we were part of the JPME world, which is why they call us. That's, that's right. right. And, and, and that, that gets me to that point, right? Which is, of all these questions, of the three questions here, of this sort of how do we think about this mentality? How are we as, as PME faculty? What has been, I'll say, the most difficult question for you to ask yeah. and address and to grapple with given the students, given our environment, yeah. given the five-sided building across the river, right? And all of those things. Um, yeah, it, It's a great challenge. Um, that having been said, uh, it's been a great pleasure to learn from you, sir. Thank you. Right back at you. Um, well, first of all, let me just add an aside about the commie pinkos in the Department of Social Sciences. Um, that's right. No, uh, we were known as uh, the Lincoln Brigade, and it was not because we had had a department chair in the 1950s and 60s by the name of the Lincoln. It was because of the original Lincoln Brigade. And I'll just tell you, all you kids out there in the audience, look it up uh, and uh, ask your parents or grandparents about the forms they had to fill in if they ever applied for federal employment, where it would say, are you now or have you ever been a member of these organizations? and the Lincoln Brigade was one. Um, the hardest thing. Uh, this can be a really painful, um, seriously soul-wrenching corner of the academic profession because of the nature of what our students are called on to do. Um, and you cannot allow yourself to get too distant from that. 
And it's very easy to, when things are peaceful and quiet in the world, which was another time and many decades ago, uh, to, to not bear that in mind. There are, there are 13 graves in the West Point Cemetery or in Section 60 in Arlington um, that I visit regularly. Students who I taught, uh, individuals who embodied that uh, painfully beautiful statement um, by Pericles in the funeral oration in um, the history of the Peloponnesian Wars about those who can be accounted as truly brave or those who know the meaning of what is sweet in life and what is terrible and still go out undeterred to meet what is to come. I used to read that quote at the end of classes, and then all of a sudden, after 9-11, that became a very real very, very real part of my my world. Um, it was painful when those students did not come back. It was often very, very painful and still is talking with some of those students who did come back and what they brought with them. Some of them were still wrestling with, well, all of them are still wrestling and questioning uh, things that um, that they did not expect or they were not prepared to deal with, how could they be when they left? Um, and the, I would remind myself now every day to, to always be mindful of that. And again, it's not just a PME thing. I, um, I taught a, a graduate level course at Columbia uh, actually started teaching it three months after 9-11, and very, very quickly, I began to have classes filled with students who not only were on their way to go do uh, things with uh, humanitarian assistance organizations and government organizations and militaries in other countries, but many who had many. been there already, for whom this idea of uh, conflict and irregular warfare and terrorism was something they had been wrestling with, as many of our students have, for much of their lives. Um, if we're doing it right, we, we can't get away from that. We can't avoid it. Um, but we have to be mindful of the effect it has on us, whether it causes us to either pull our punches or causes us to, uh, to maybe push things farther than they should because we're trying to prevent something that, that we just have no control over. Um, some of you remember a, a colleague of ours, I won't mention his name, uh, who was here in the uh, earlier years when uh, when Pete and Elena and I were teaching here, uh, who is now teaching at another university in the, in the Northwest. And he had a particularly traumatic occurrence because he had a student, an advisee, um, who had been in his classes when he talked about the interplay between domestic and international and civil military relations and governance and all those other things. And that individual went back to his country and led a coup and was killed in that coup. Um, and our colleague wrote a very, um, very painful and very moving article about that. And I, I've never asked him if that was part of the reason why he left, but I can't help but think that it, it may have been. So um, yeah, that's what, uh, you know, the old uh, saw about the, uh, the Spartan mother uh, who would, when in the moment of, of glory and pride, when the young son would be presented with the shield, would come up and whisper, you know, with your shield or upon it, um, you, uh, <laughs> you, you have to remind yourself that, uh, that that in fact is, uh, is something that, that you have to not only tell your students, but tell yourself, because otherwise you end up like Archimedes, right? So completely divorced from the reality of everything going around on around him, um, you know, noli tubari uh, circulus mias, don't disturb my circles. Um, so uh, you don't want that to happen. So we're at time, but we've got another question from the audience and also one from online. Do you mind I, taking the extra space? I, I, ain't, I ain't going anywhere. All right. Um, I mean, you don't have a cruise booked in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, first of all, thank you for your leadership and mentorship. Oh, and looking back at your career, 
what would you what kind of advice would you give to us who are trying to follow in your footsteps what not to do so trying to to Ooh, learn okay. from someone else's mistake okay uh first advice i probably should have put this up front comes from the oldest professor in history if they offer you hemlock don't take it okay um uh second um take whatever opportunity you can to reconnect to not just uh, the changing academic fundamentals, and I think we all do that in a very admirable way here in, in CISA, in, in, in an environment in the JPME where, it's, where that is difficult to do on a regular basis, but uh, take the time and take the opportunities to, uh, uh, to involve yourself in and to engage with um, those who are part of the policy world. Uh, I know Mike Bell, when he was chancellor, had talked about the idea of, of um, having kind of a two-level sabbatical process where you went off and, and did the kinds of academic sabbaticals that UNP did, but then you also went off and spent six months to a year in uh, in a government agency or a nonprofit or an international organization and, and kind of put those academic ideas in the tumbler up against um the the uh, the so-called real world um yeah i i i think that's the most if if what you're doing as a baseline keeping yourself open to new ideas being curious allowing yourself to have your ideas sparked not just by the latest article you read in international security but a song you hear on spotify or a line in a movie that you're watching or some phenomenon that you natural phenomenon that you stumble across in your day to day life. Um, that's the best device I think I can give. I hope I'm right. So, and the online questioner says. And the online questioner who is Russ Burgos um, says. Oh, I knew I wasn't going to get through this without a Russ Burgos question. <laughs> And it's a good one too. Okay. Um, with respect to civilian uh, military faculty tension, from your perspective, to what extent is acquiring conversational fluency in military speak incumbent on uh, Title Ten faculty, and vice okay. versa for uh, the military side? What kind of obligation do you have to learn? Uh, how do you put it? Um, conversational fluency in the norms of academia. Okay. Okay. And I, I think hopefully that was a loaded question that Russ knows what my answer is already going to be. Uh, I spent 26 years in uniform. Before that, I was an army brat. I, I was literally born in an army hospital, went to 12 schools before I graduated uh, high school. I've been around the army for a long time. I have heard all the acronyms, some of which cannot be repeated in this form. Uh, I have uh, used them in everyday conversation. Uh, I have two children who are now adults who don't know how to open a can without using a P38. If you don't know what that is, kids, look it up. Um, and I was also very involved in actually writing doctrine with coming up with some of those acronyms that we now use. I'm not fluent in all this stuff. You can't know all those elements. What you can do is recognize and respect the fact that there is a different language. What you can do is interact um, and engage with your colleagues who have that experience. You know, you don't go to the like a middle school cafeteria where it's like, you know, the sportos are over here and the goths are over here and the uh, and the, the 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 drama and music types over in that corner. Uh, no, no, no. I I want to walk into whatever our equivalent of cafeteria is, and see the Title Ten, the MILFAC, and the State Department person sitting down with each other over lunch and saying, "What What do you mean by that? What What is that phrase?" If you're constantly engaged in that kind of interaction, um, both will be for the better for it. Uh, I would like to believe that I can master all those things. Uh, just within my own service, I don't, let alone, you know, the stuff that comes out of Scott's mouth that's Navy speak. And, and you know, I went to the Naval War College, so I'm therefore an expert. I have no idea what he's talking about. But I'm going to ask, or at least I'm going to go, <laughs> man, you are right there. Google. Um, so I'm not sure if that will satisfy Russ, but 
let's face it, Russ is never really satisfied, which is what makes Russ such a good professor. <laughs> Let me guess, Russ's colleagues? Okay. Okay, so do you want to hear the rest of the story that's part of the title here? Which is what I thought Pete was, I thought I'd set you up to ask this question, man. No, I did not tell you what happens when Plutarch, Gertrude Stein, and Marshall McLuhan walk into a bar. Well, no. Um, so uh, Plutarch, Gertrude Stein, and Marshall McLuhan walk into a bar, and the bartender, depending on how I tell this, is either Thomas Kuhn or Bob Jervis. Again, look them up. Um, and they say, so what do you have? Um, Plutarch, of course, as a historian, says, uh, I'll have an old fashioned. Could you set it on fire? Um, Gertrude is fascinated by the question and then just cryptically says, a rosé is a rosé is a rosé. And McLuhan thinks about it and says, um, I will have the inevitable disruptive paradigmatic effects of whatever they're having. Okay, what do I do now, Dana? I'll tell you, and I'll even put it in the mic so that if you're uh, on campus online, uh, if you're around, join us for some celebratory Prosecco in uh, the CISA faculty lounge. We'll carry mm -hmm. on the conversation there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Say again. Uh, and thanks to everybody online. I hope they were able to download and get in.